so when I saw the scripture I was reading when the email came out, I kind of fell into a crisis. I did not really know what to do for this opening statement. So then the obvious came to me what to talk about here. So this is a scripture from Psalm and it talks a lot. You'll hear the word of love a lot in the scripture. And when I think of love, think of love between all of us. And I also think how little of it we see between us as individuals today. A little while back, I devised a concept that I called a status toxicity complex. Definitely not taken from the military industrial complex concept. <laughs> but this was the idea that you get out there, do well for yourself, win big, accumulate wealth, earn your degrees in college. Don't worry about consequences. Consequences are for the masses. This is something I see a lot nowadays where you prioritize you and your success over anything else. Anything else can be come at that cost. To put, it mild, to put it mildly, I do not like this. So when I read this scripture and we talk about the Lord's love, it makes, I like it because it reminds us that there is something more than posting images of you drinking Starbucks lattes on Instagram. So without further babble, let's read this. Oh, give thanks to God, for he is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and that I um, and, and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. The, the, this is the Lord's doing uh, in, in, in its, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we bese be beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. The Lord has given us light. Bind the, fest, bind the fetal possession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol, um, extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. For God's steadfast love endures forever. It's that time of year again where we read a scripture we've probably heard a thousand times by now. This one is, I think, about a cult or palm leaves or something. <laughs> something I think that is important to learn as followers of Jesus is that love is infinite, but our brains are finite. So when we, and likewise, the Bible verses are very finite, but very long. I think it's very easy for us to get jaded from hearing the same thing over and over again. But at the same time, it reminds us of what Jesus did before his inevitable crucifixion and ascension to God. And what I think is also important to recognize as followers of Jesus, is just how recently this actually was. 2,000 years ago, less, sounds like a long time, but it actually isn't. For instance, uh, there's this little country you probably haven't heard of. It's called China. The earliest remnants of civilization there was 5,000 years before Jesus. So from their perspective, Jesus in the future is more than twice as much of time as Jesus is to us in the past. 
And what, like, what, what has happened since then? Uh, the Roman Empire has fallen. The Holy Roman Empire came to be. Constantinople fell, which I guess that is when the Roman Empire really fell. The Holy Roman Empire fell again. Not even they could carry on their title. The, uh, the Soviet Union has come and gone. The, the point is that this was in this very, it's a pretty short period of time since this, all this happened, since Jesus was crucified. And he told these, his disciples to go get that cult from that village. So as jaded as we might be from the scriptures, and as recently as it might be, let's take the time to read Mark 11, uh, 11, 1 through 11. A lot of ones. When they, that being Jesus and his growing group of followers, were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it. And he will send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? Why are you doing this? They told them what Jesus had said. The bystanders allowed the disciples to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw on and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had taken from the fields or cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our ancestor David. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was already too, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with his 12. English has changed a lot in the past 2000 years. A demonstration at the National Mall created a tense standoff between government officials and members of a cult led by a self-styled messiah who goes by the name of Jesus. In an unauthorized incursion into the airspace around the capital, Jesus and a few of his close associates navigated a hot air balloon, which they later referred to as Air Farce One, to a landing in the mall where a large group of followers met him in a Volkswagen Beetle, which they rode to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in a mock ticker tape parade created by his followers throwing confetti. Once at the memorial, Jesus took to the steps where Martin Luther King Jr. famously delivered his I Have a Dream speech to preach a sermon about what he called the dangerous mix of religion and politics today, including comments about the National Cathedral, which some took to be a threat to destroy the building. Officials at the National Cathedral issued a statement which read, while we support free speech and diverse religious expression, we cannot dismiss threats against this venerable national treasure and will pursue, pursue prosecution to the fullest extent of the law. National Park Service police report that in dispersing the crowd, they were unable to apprehend the leadership. They're working with the FBI to investigate who is responsible for the demonstration and expect to make arrests by the end of the week. When my colleague Ian Lynch shared his news story with a bunch of other colleagues, I thought that's the opener for the sermon. I've been preaching about Palm Sunday for 37 years. 
As Diana Butler Bass says, Holy Week keeps coming around like liturgical clockwork. <laughs> and while I wondered what I might say this year, like Bass, I found myself uh, singing uh, a song from Jesus Christ Superstar, the Palm Sunday song. Hosanna, hey, Zana, Zana, Zana. You can sing along. Zana, Hosanna, hey, Zana. Hey, JC, JC, won't you smile at me? Zana, Hosanna, hey, superstar. Maybe that dates me. Uh, <laughs> this musical setting, the music itself, I think, leads us to mistranslate the word Hosanna. The joyfulness of the music makes the word sound like another non-English word that means sort of the same thing as Alleluia, maybe. In fact, Hosanna and Alleluia are not the same. Hosanna is a transliteration of the Hebrew that means, oh, save us now, please save. The crowd at the procession wasn't praising Jesus, the crowd at his procession were begging Jesus, begging Jesus to save them. Knowing that he was begging, that they were begging him to save them may, I hope, prompt the question, save from what? 18 years ago, <clears throat> Two of my biblical scholar heroes, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg, published a little book called The Last Week. It starts off with this powerful explanation of what's going on in the story. I'm a slide behind. <laughs> Two processions enter Jerusalem on a spring day in the year 30. One was a peasant procession, the other an imperial procession. From the east, Jesus rode a donkey down the Mount of Olives, cheered by his followers. On the opposite side of the city from the west, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea and Samaria, entered Jerusalem at the head of a column of imperial cavalry and soldiers. Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. Pilots proclaimed the power of empire. The two processions embody the central conflict of the week that led to Jesus' crucifixion. Well, I don't know what evidence Crossan and Borg have for claiming that the processions happened on the same day I wouldn't put it past Jesus to schedule his to occur on the same day as Pilate's. Jesus' procession was a counter procession to Pilate's show of force. And that makes it clear that Jesus' procession was a political act. It was designed to get people to sit up and take notice. It was no accident that Jesus rooted his procession in his faith tradition. Get the people to see the vision of old by acting it out for them. So Jesus' procession purposely utilized images of a prophecy from Zechariah in the Hebrew scriptures, Zechariah envisioned a humble king who arrives in Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt. That king will end all wars. No more chariots, no more war horses, no more battle bows. This king commands peace. Of course, Pontius Pilate wasn't a king of peace. He commanded an army on behalf of Caesar. And while he thought he was using the army to keep the peace, it was a negative peace at best, the absence of trouble. There was no justice in Pax Romana, and so it was no real peace. 
Pilate's army was there to make sure the Jews didn't cause any trouble for the Roman rulers during the holy days of Passover, a religious festival that is about liberation from oppression, a great time of the year to rise up against an oppressor. As his procession made its way to the city gate, most likely no one cheered Pilate. The crowds hated and feared him. Bass suggests that there could have been paid supporters that would have been there sent out to shout Ave Pilate, Hail Pilate, as he entered to soothe his imperial ego. Maybe a few powerful people in Jerusalem actually approved of him or wanted something from him and shouted their praise. Chances are, however, the road at the West Gate was relatively deserted as the Romans approached. The only sounds were the dreaded clomp clomp of armored horses and chariot wheels traversing cobblestones. Pilate in regal splendor probably wanted to be home at his seaside villa instead of there with the unruly Jews. Meanwhile, at the Eastern Gate, Jesus' noisy supporters were crying Hosanna save us please save us now they weren't asking for some spiritual salvation for a place in heaven or for eternal life they wanted to be saved from Pilate, from the legion entering their gate from caesar from the foe piece of roman swords i see a deep and disturbing parallel between the foe piece of roman swords and the rise of Christian nationalism in the United States. And as I move into this next section of my sermon, let me say that I don't really want to preach it, to be honest. Christian nationalism is deeply connected to the Republican Party, and I have no desire to get partisan. But Christian nationalism, regardless of what political party they were to hitch their wagon to, is such a threat to both Christianity and American democracy, I feel compelled to speak. The United States is not and was never a Christian nation. The United States is shaped by Christianity and especially Protestantism. Both of those statements are true. Christian nationalism wants to make the first statement false. In general, Christian nationalism seeks to merge Christian and American identities. The danger here is that by merging Christian and American identities, both Christian faith and America's constitutional democracy are distorted. Christian nationalism demands Christianity be privileged by the state and implies that to be a good American, one must be Christian. And Christian nationalism almost always overlaps with and provides cover for white supremacy, racial subjugation, and patriarchy. Here's how Christians against Christian nationalism defines Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is a cultural framework that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. Christian nationalism contends that America has been and should always be distinctively Christian from top to bottom in its self-identity, interpretations of its own history, sacred symbols, cherished values, and public policies. And it aims to keep it that way. But the Christian in Christian nationalism is more about identity than religion. It carries with it assumptions about nativism, white supremacy, authoritarianism, patriarchy, and militarism. And I would point out that none of those are Christian values. One Christian nationalist group is the Society for American Civic Renewal. Josh Kovensky wrote an expose of this group on Talking Points Memo. 
this group, Society for American Civic Renewal, or SACR as its members pronounced its um, initialization. He wrote that uh, it is open to new recruits provided you meet a few criteria. You are male, you are a Trinitarian Christian, you're a heterosexual, you're an unhyphenated American, and can answer questions about Trump, the Republican Party, and the Christian nationalism in the right way. One chapter leader wrote to a prospective member that the group aimed to secure a future for Christian families. One of Sacker's objectives is to have its members from the government form the government of an aligned future regime. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by an aligned future regime, but that's one of their stated goals. Other goals include providing preferential treatment for members, especially in business, direct quote, and to both coordinate allied fraternal networks and defend fraternal networks against attacks by those who oppose, who, those opposed to civic renewal and strongly deter such attacks. I hear these descriptions of what this organization embraces, and I think of the Communist Party in China, I think of Putin's kleptocracy, and I think of how Nazis functioned in Germany as they gained more and more power. The whole idea of forming a truly Christian nation is heresy. Christianity has a long history of wanting to get into bed with political power. And when it has done it, it has always lost its relationship with God, drunk on that political power. I think it is vital that Christians point out that Christian nationalism is a heresy. Two processions entered Jerusalem. One proclaimed the political and military might of empire. The other proclaimed the kingdom of God. Christian nationalism wants to merge the Christian faith with the power of empire. And the event from the gospel narrative that we celebrate today says that such a merger is impossible. The crowd that gathered, waving branches and spreading their cloaks on the road, shouting, Hosanna, save us, son of David, wanted to be saved from the misery of Pilate and Caesar and Rome. They were begging to be rescued from oppression and injustice, from violence and death. Friends, Hosanna's still resound. Even the stones cry out for justice. Children and teachers die in pools of blood at school. Lies pervade and divide a desperate people. The rich steal everyone's share. Courts unwind decades of justice. And even a position, even a poisoned earth and sky rage against us. <coughs> we have to peel off the mask of the faux peace that is enforced by fear and violence, a peace and privilege, a peace of privilege and guns. We must shout, Hosanna, Jesus, Hosanna, save us now. Two processions enter Jerusalem that day. The same question, the same alternative faces those who would be faithful to Jesus today. Which procession are we in? Which procession do we want to be in? This is the question of Palm Sunday and of the week that is about to unfold. Amen.